Okay, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to see such a large crowd. My name is Jill Van Matry and I'm the Associate Director of the Atlas Institute. As many of you know, one of the primary goals of Atlas is to foster events that allow people to explore the interaction between information and communication technology with society. Um, and this Atlas Speaker Series was created in furtherance of this goal and made possible by a generous donation from Adit Harrell Caperton and Anant Harrell. So we're thrilled to be able to include tonight's event as part of this series. In particular, tonight's event is exceptionally exciting because of the cross-campus collaboration that went into making it possible. So with that, I'd like to thank some of the people and organizations that helped to bring this event here. Um, I'll start with from Atlas, a big thanks to Ira, Bruce, Vicki, Brett, and Gary. But then also a big thank you to the Friends of the Library, the Center for the Humanities and the Arts, the Book Arts League, the English Department, and of course, Scripta Lab. And so with that, I'll hand things over to Professor James Asher, who's the motivating force of Scripta Lab. And James, thank you so much for including Atlas in this exceptional event. That was great, thank you, Jill. It's, it's a pleasure to collaborate with so many people and, and Atlas has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful partner in this and I can't even begin to express my gratitude to all the people who've worked to make this happen. Um, Scriptalab, what is that? Well, Scriptalab runs at the university libraries. We're interested in the question of materiality and immateriality in media. And of course, this makes a natural tie to what Atlas is interested in, looking at media. But of course, Scriptalab really wouldn't be anything without our board of advisors. I'd like to take a moment to recognize them. I think some of them are here. Um, I'll, I'll try to mention them in alphabetical order. So if, if, if you're on the advisory board for Scripta Lab, stand up and I'll call your name. So Mark America is not around. Lori Emerson, let's give Lori a hand. Um, Michael Zimmerman. Um, William Cuskin. And Deborah Fink. These names and these faces are the people who help us plan our sort of collaborations and the people we're going to bring to campus. So it is my absolute delight to introduce our speaker for tonight. Ian Bogos is associate professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he not only talks about literature, video games, design, research, and philosophy, but he makes these things as well. So he's probably familiar to all of you here. And so please join me in welcoming Ian. Thank you very much um, for having me here. I'm, I'm excited to have been invited to dump literally everything on my laptop out at you over the next uh, three or four hours. Okay. This is a GIF image that I made. Uh, it's eight by eight pixels in size, uh, but I've, I've blown it up so that you can see it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an attractive image. Uh, it's got two nice shades of blue in it and a, an interesting pattern. And you can imagine uh, how you might use such an image. Those of you who uh, make web pages or, or other kinds of computer media may, may uh, have put such images uh, on those web pages through, uh, through tags that are capable of instructing a browser to download an image and display it on the screen. Uh, now, this is one way of looking at this particular this particular pattern, this particular slash through a square. Uh, and I want to show you uh, a, similar, a similar image that, uh, that takes a, a very different form. So I'm going to go back and forth between some software and, uh, and the presentation a couple times. And I'll just ask you to forgive the sort of strange transitions. OK. Um, this is my Commodore 64 uh, emulator. <laughs> 
So uh, this is my favorite. Um, hello, are we still here? Okay, good. Uh, this is my favorite one line um, basic program. Don't worry if you don't know what's going on here. It's uh, okay. Um, so this is one line of, of instructions. Uh, B basic is 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 in ROM on on the Commodore, so we can just we can just run these programs um, directly after the the machine boots. Uh, and what we'll get after a while is a well, just a very aesthetically pleasing kind of maze-like pattern. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that it's actually built out of that that same image or seemingly. Uh, that same image uh, that I just showed you, but but clearly it's doing something very different, right? Okay, that's enough Commodore for now. So, if we look at the two versions of this of this image, one which is generated by a graphics program, saved as a file, and then in this case displayed on a computer, um, and then the one that is called up. In, in, the, in the case of the basic program, what is actually happening is that there's a character map somewhere in the ROM of the machine that has this pattern in it. And if we compare the two and kind of try to understand what's going on between them, something quite startling comes about. Now, if you know anything about uh, basic programming, you'll, you'll notice that uh, I was essentially just printing a character instruction and, and changing it by one. Uh, and it's, a, it's an accident, really, that it was possible to get that pattern, an accident of the, uh, you seeing this okay? Yeah. An accident of the, the Petsky character map that was built into the Commodore 64 operating system. As you can see here, those two characters, the, the, the sort of left and right horizontal uh, or diagonal slash, they happen to be next to each other. They're contiguous in the, in the character map. So when I take the number that corresponds with the first one's position and add one or zero to it, which is all that that basic program does, and print the result to the screen, I get that kind of magical emergent uh, result. Uh, a, a few friends of mine and I, uh, a while back, decided that we wanted to, uh, to try to write the most compact version of this program as possible. Here's a, a 6502 assembly version of the, of the same program. Uh, and, and again, you don't really need to know what's going on here, apart from the fact that there are some very peculiar features of this computer, of the Commodore 64, that we're exploiting uh, to get that pattern. One of them being that its, its sound chip is, uh, is capable of generating random numbers very efficiently. So I didn't have to write any code. It was all, all built in to, uh, uh, to the operating system in this case. And then another being that there is a, um, uh, there is a subroutine in this, uh, in this computer that will take a character and print it out to the screen, much in the same way that the, the print command did. And so if we compare uh, these, two, these two pieces of data, the, the program file that I can run on the Commodore 64 to get that endless shifting pattern of, of maze that you saw, and the, and the GIF image, which is created through uh, a technique known as run length encryption in which colors are embedded into the header of the file and then pointers to those colors run throughout along with the, the distance, the amount of space uh, that those colors should run from. What you'll see is that the, 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 the considerably more complex and, and aesthetically interesting Commodore 64 program is, is half the size of the little image that I can, uh, I can load on a web page. Now, it would be possible to make some value judgments about this. We could call the, uh, the, the image on, uh, on the left side uh, better. Uh, we could call it more complex. We could call the one on the right more modern and more relevant. Uh, but what's interesting to me is just that they, they appear to be the same in certain ways, but are also uh, very different in, in their material construction. And that's, uh, that's what I want to talk about today, is the, the various ways that materiality underlies creativity and expression and understanding, uh, even though we've consistently ignored it uh, throughout the last century. Now, I, uh, I study video games most of the time, as you may know already. And when I think about video game studies, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, with this field, uh, it, it's actually the case that, that uh, most people don't think about computation in, in game studies. Uh, there's, a, there's a version of, of a talk like this that I might, I might call computers and other ignored topics in, in video game studies. Or, or we could say the same thing, I think, of, of media studies in general, new media studies, that you know, th there are these computers that are underlying the artifacts that we're talking about, but we, we tend to ignore them. And, uh, and push them to the margins. 
within uh, game studies, just to give you a, a brief and sorted uh, history of our young field, uh, early proponents of, of game studies really saw video games as part of a broader tradition of play uh, and games in, in the more general sense. So despite this little wired uh, quip, uh, Gonzalo Frasca, who was an early, uh, an early game scholar, uh, adopted this term ludology, not just to mean the, the academic study of video games, but really to, to mean the, the study of games in general and video games in particular. It's, it's interesting to, 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 to reflect on that, especially in the context of the primary methodological disputes that arose in the early days of uh, ludology, uh, now more than 10 years ago, in which uh, there were these kind of uh, uh, cold, tall formalists of Northern Europe uh, who argued uh, against the naively romantic narrativists of, of North America who were considerably hairier and, and shorter. Um, and the, the ludologists uh, derided the, the narrativists' attempts to, to colonize games, that looting this new and promising field and returning those spoils like Vikings back to their home disciplines, like literature and film studies, uh, which were about literature and film, not about games at all. And they had a point, right? It, it didn't make sense to treat games as something that was the same as literature and film. There was also something terribly ironic about this move. Uh, the ludologist position, for example, held that games were, were unique. We shouldn't reduce them to other media, like film and literature. But then at the same time, the, the material stuff out of which games themselves were made, whether those be computer hardware or dice and cards, were essentially assumed to be, to be interchangeable. We didn't have to worry about that. We could study games in general. And then the, the social scientists invaded. And these studies uh, focus, as you'd expect, on the social practices of game players, uh, strong interest in players over texts, with multiplayer experiences like massively multiplayer games uh, prevailing. And research in this genre includes you know, topics about player communities, about the economics of virtual worlds, about property rights, and, and so forth. And, and despite um, uh, sociology's uh, occasional reliance on, on Latourian actor network theory, these are really studies of use rather than of aesthetics. They're not so concerned about the technical infrastructures that undergird the artifacts that make social action possible. Uh, it's really about the, the human invention and, and shaping that, that prevail. We also have had uh, these kind of analyses of artistic modes of production in games. Uh, Alex Galloway has argued that uh, despite appearing to offer um, more options and more control than other media, actually video games only feign this freedom and instead they perform uh, information control, which is a, a characteristic of contemporary uh, capitalist culture. And Mackenzie Wark has offered this concept of game space, and, and he, in a similar move, suggests that games are just a utopic simulation of a world that's becoming increasingly game-like, and play kind of validates that, that commodity fetishism. Uh, and weirdly, in, in the, despite the kind of Marxist angle with which uh, uh, folks like Alex and Ken approach their studies, the nature of computers themselves as modes of production, as well as the, the, the machine's kind of connection to the historical spread of of capitalism and industrialism, I think, have, have gone under notice. Now, in some of my early work, uh, I have maintained what I guess is a, an unfashionably optimistic belief in the representational capacity of computer media, especially if we consider the approaches just described. Ken Wark once told me that this was perhaps the least interesting feature of video games. And, and in these books, for example, I tried to show that you know, a perspective from computation gives us greater analytical inroads uh, than the traditions of uh, you know, games of, of war and chance and leisure or, or those of social practices that happen to include games. But, but even then, I think that connection has been uh, too high level. It's not enough just to say, well, you know, games are software, and our understanding of them at least demands some attention to the architecture of computers. Or rather, we have to look more granularly at the subject. E each video game is a particular piece of software created and run on a particular piece of computer hardware at a particular moment in time. So just as that, that Commodore 64 pattern is a kind of emergent accident of the way that the hardware was architected and the way that someone was able to exploit and kind of discover uh, a feature of that system that allowed it to produce that pattern. Uh, so every artifact, every computer artifact uh, 
exists in this kind of this kind of weird, unstable relationship with itself and and, and, and with history, looking backward toward toward influence, but also toward uh, you know the material constraints out of which it emerged. And if we were to take this approach, it would actually be uh, all encompassing. It wouldn't simply be techno fetishist. We would we would be able to reconcile the social and critical and material and political and economic registers upon which we might understand software artifacts like video games by, by thinking about the, the ways that they're constructed and how those, how those constructions affect all of those registers. And uh, you know, if we kind of back up uh, considerably, I, I think that this sickness, uh, I, I've been giving you an, a kind of characterization of the ignorance of materiality in, in game studies because I'm interested in, in game studies, but more generally, this is a sickness that, that, that affects more than, than just computers or computer games or new media. And in our now 60 year long obsession with cultural studies and the linguistic turn, which extends back even further and even approaches like the social construction of technology and sociology and actor network theory, uh, and all these purportedly anti-deterministic approaches to human culture, we seem to have donned increasingly large blinkers uh, that are blinding us to the material stuff through which we create and understand things. I don't think it takes much digging to discover how the roots of material analysis in, in cultural studies uh, have, have missed out on observations from, from ignoring materiality or downplaying it. And I, I thought it might be helpful to talk about three areas uh, that, uh, that all, all deal, I mean, all have materiality, but different kinds of materiality. Um, where they exert enormous force, whether or not we pay attention to that force. And, uh, and those are these language uh, images and, and, and machines. And so we'll kind of start, um, we'll start thinking about words and, and books and things and move into visual culture and into, uh, into computation toward the end. And then I'll circle back with a bunch of very strange uh, examples of, of how to think about materiality and computational creativity. So you know, if you think about language and, 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 and the use of, of language creatively and expressively, in, in, in literary studies, uh, which is where I did my PhD and uh, all my degrees really, uh, but, but especially in, in comparative literary studies, we, we do have a tendency to focus on language and literature together. We, we assume that it's important to know something about language in order to make observations uh, about literature. And those, those collective trends that we named the linguistic turn all point to the, you know, the nature of language as an agent for structuring experience and meaning. Uh, and we could look at this from a number of directions. Uh, you know, philologically speaking, we can, we can think about the, the cultural context and shifts and the grammatical and rhetorical uses of language in particular cultural traditions uh, that, that precede any particular instance of expression in those contexts. And then if we look at you know, the history of structuralism, then uh, anthropological approaches always rely, or often rely, on, on, on language as a window into specific uh, human activity. So you know, there's this famous example from Pensée Sauvage in which Lévi-Strauss depicts the way Chinook confuses abstract and concrete references, or you know, we would say confuses. Uh, for Chinook speakers, it's rather a feature rather than a defect of the language. And when we, when we say, um, the bad man killed the unfortunate child. This this uh, assumes that there's some concept like 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 you know a bad man, and that, and that a man can change its nature, uh, and that there is agency in the man that is uh, uh, executing this misfortune. Whereas uh, in Chinook, badness and misfortune are these kind of ethereal ideas that that, that might invade and, and and overtake us, uh, rather than uh, reflect individual choice. You know, these should be familiar, familiar kinds of examples. And you know, more recently, we've seen cognitive linguistics pick up uh, language as a kind of structural uh, 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 system for, for meaning making, making different observations about the influence of language and ideas and expression. I, I guess the, the most famous of this is Lakoff Johnson conceptual meta metaphor theory. Um, and uh, Lakoff and Johnson argue that we, we tend to understand concepts in terms of another via these, these mappings and blends. Uh, so we might characterize argument as, as war or as battle, and we talk about you know, shooting down an objection or, or have a criticism, criticism being right on target, that, that this, this kind of metaphor theory is, is structuring the way that we, that we think uh, about one domain in terms of another. But then you know, in, in, in literary terms, um, there's certainly a long tradition of looking at the way that literary forms 
clarify the relationship between their, their, their construction, the concreteness of language out of which they're made, and how those constraints uh, produce creative forces. Um, so I think of something like the, the Homeric epithet, uh, which is a, a very convenient uh, uh, crutch for the orator who has to not so much remember and recite the epic poem as reconstruct it from a series of patterns. So the, 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 the metric filler that you get from a mnemonic device um, like this one, Glaucopis Athene, which is like Aulide, Aulide Athena, um, you know, you can be a somewhat lazy orator and know that any time you, you have to say Athena, then you've got this, you've got this little piece of language that you can, you can slot in that will fit the meter uh, and that will also invoke you know, a, an image uh, every time that will remain the same. Or, or, or at a higher level, the way that meter itself is, is a structure, um, that meter is what makes poetry poetry, uh, at least in the ancient world, it's what makes poetry poetry. Um, and to construct a poem means to put language together in, uh, in this case, dactylic hexameter. You know, that, 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 that the, the, the way that a work is constructed is, is formally represented, not just a, a matter of the meaning of the words out of which it's constructed. And, you know, this is nothing unfamiliar to us in, 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 in uh, modern literature either. I mean, if you write a sonnet or a sestina or a haiku or what have you, you are always exploring the configurations of language that intersect with different rules of composition. But these are still uh, uh, kind of evolutionary, you know, whether, whether it's evolutionary on the, on the, uh, on the scale of, of, uh, of human culture um, or evolutionary on the scale of uh, human evolution. That is to say, um, language evolves over uh, many hundreds or thousands uh, of years, whereas uh, poetic forms uh, influence one another and kind of blend uh, together over time. But, but there's also um, the invention, the invention from whole cloth of, of new forms. Um, mnemonics or meter or form uh, are different from the invention of linguistic constraint with the explicit purpose of creating a, a new form of expression, which is, which is exactly what the, what the Ulipo prides himself on doing, on inventing, reviving, or adopting different forms for, for literary expression. And each of these kind of changes the possibility space of that expression. So like the palindrome, as a, as a borrowed structure that's kind of you know, recast as, as being potentially creatively interesting uh, is, is one example. This is uh, a modern palindrome called 2002 by uh, my friend Nick Montford and William Gillespie that is 2002 words long and reads the same backwards and forwards. Uh, or the lipogram, uh, the most famous of which is this novel by Georges Perec called La Disparition in which the letter E does not make an appearance in the entire novel. Well, there's a uh, uh, substantive plus seven, the, 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 uh, the, the, the replacement of a noun with the one seven ahead of it in, in the dictionary, another Ulipian uh, experimental constraint. This is, one, this is one of my games where we use this technique to make nonsense language out of, out of newspaper headlines. Um, or, or even the, the construction of arbitrarily odd books and, and th that can be configured and read in different ways uh, this is this is a, a very famous uh, set of, of, of sonnets, um, which can be can be reconfigured in, into um, many many billions of possibilities by uh, by turning individual lines. So you know, Ulipo you could say imposes more stringent material restrictions than those just of natural grammar and convention, um, but but more importantly than that, the, the the Olympians are both inventing and deploying these material constraints. They're not just kind of taking what was left, but are thinking about their work on both registers. Um, and, then, and then kind of returning those, those forms to the world for, for possible exploitation in, in ways that they might not have, they may not have thought of. And the reader of these works can't really ignore, I mean, I, I guess you could ignore the way that this book looks, or you could even ignore the fact that Perec's novel does not have the letter E in it. Some of the early reviews did this, in fact. They failed, failed to take into account the, 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 the fundamental feature of the novel. Uh, but, but in general, you, you, kind of, you kind of have to deal with this. You have to deal with the fact that the rules of composition seem uh, inextricable and, and incredibly tightly coupled to the meaning of the work. Uh, La disperation, after, after all, means the disappearance, and it's, it's about uh, uh, a group of uh, hunting buddies who can't find their, their companion, whose name is Vowel. 
This, this continues to be uh, an exciting opportunity for writers, uh, maybe even more exciting opportunity for writers now that writing is becoming so digital. Uh, Jonathan Foer has been recently working on this strange novel called Tree of Codes, which is a novel cut out of Bruno Schultz's Street of Crocodiles. Uh, and you can see what it looks like here. So he took, the, he took a book and he excised different portions of the book to produce another book kind of inside of it. Um, and, and one of the things Forrest said ab about, the, ab about the book is that uh, at times I felt that I was making a gravestone rubbing of the Street of Crocodiles, and at times that I was transcribing a dream that the Street of Crocodiles might have had. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the idea that, uh, that this is a, a kind of a, an uncreative act is, um, uh, is simply not the case, if we take uh, Forrest's word for it. And then if you, if you look at the artifact, you can't help but engage with that at the, at the material level as well as at the, at the semantic level. Now, you know, of course, you know, th there's, a, there's a long history of thinking about the, the history of, of the book and the, the importance of different forms uh, of writing and how, how writing was produced and disseminated whether it was you know, clay or wax or papyrus or parchment or codex or movable type or what have you. Um, but I think in general, even, even with the book, the form of the book as an object is something that we, we, just, we just don't think about much, much at all. I had this experience recently. I was reading page proofs of my last book. And um, you get them like this, you know, like they're printed out or, or they're in PDF form. And I, I, I was, in, in this case, I was trying to reconcile the location of this image, uh, this figure on the page. And, and as you can see, it's, it's set off to the side of, of, of the margin, um, which, you know, when cropped and bound um, in a codex would make sense. But, but when you look at it on the, on the screen like this, it's, it's, it's not immediately obvious exactly why the image is in, is in the place it's at. And, and when I thought about this, I realized that I never see my books until they're printed, which is really disturbing. And so, I, you know, I started, like, printing these print-on-demand prototypes of, of books that I'm working on. And you don't, you don't get a, a complete uh, feeling of what the final object will look like. You know, the paper caliber varies and the, and the feel of the, of, the, of the book and the trim size isn't always, isn't always possible. But, but the very idea that, as, especially as academics, that w what we're really writing are ideas. And then you outsource the book part to your publisher. You don't even think about it. If you're very lucky, you get some input into what the cover looks like. Um, and, and I realized this recently when I, when I got this book in the mail and realized that, that MIT had done this kind of amazing half half cloth paper covered cover and I had no idea they were doing this and they didn't ask me or talk to me about it um, e even though it was, it was a very interesting and creative way of kind of characterizing the old and the new in this book and in some ways completely fundamental to the argument that, that we were trying to make uh, in the book but but of course we don't uh, we don't think about those things do we we, we simply uh, we simply write we like to think that the ideas are pure now you know in, in writing um, the visibility of a material constraint is, is, uh, is important, but it's harder to see in, in media in which there's not sole authorship, uh, where, where the complexity of constraints becomes uh, associated with manufacturing processes or other kinds of machinic processes. So if you think about like visual culture, like photography, there are all sorts of um, material constraints in, 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 at work in the production of photographic images. And you have the film itself, which is comprised of layers of photochemical surfaces that are adhered to a celluloid base. And, and one of the features of film is that emulsions can be more and less light sensitive. And this is dependent on the size of grains of silver halide on the emulsion, at least when we, when we had uh, a film that was the case. So you know, if you get a grain in your picture, um, which corresponds with a higher film speed on the, on the ISO scale, then that greater light sensitivity would produce these, these kind of coarser images. And it was a feature, a kind of aesthetic feature of, uh, of film. Uh, but it's also something that has its own aesthetic apart from its, its connection to, to film speed. And you might want to recreate that aesthetic uh, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, one of the techniques that the digital pho photographers sometimes use when they want grain is to, uh, to ratchet up the light sensitivity uh, of the sensor, the, to amplify the light sensitivity of, the, of the, the CCD sensor itself. And this often, especially in cheaper cameras, introduces chroma noise because there's higher levels of, of software interpolation that are, that are managing the data that's coming into the sensor. You can see it here. You see all the, all the color noise, which looks awful. And we, we normally look at these photographs and think that they're, they're lousy, and then we lament that we don't have uh, film anymore. But if you, if you do black and white conversions on, uh, on this, this chroma noise pattern in, in, a, in, a, in a higher uh, sensitivity digital image, then I mean, it doesn't look exactly like, like, uh, 
like uh, like film grain, but it's something akin to film grain. So there's there's some kind of aesthetic similarity between uh, 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 you know a black and white converted high chroma noise uh, image and the kind of thing that you would get from a similar act of increasing the light sensitivity of uh, of your film in a in a film camera. And you know another another material factor at work in photography is the is the camera itself, even though we, we tend to think of it as a kind of triumph of technological advancement. So the the main innovation really of this this Oscar Barnack 1913 design for the 35 millimeter camera was its ability to adopt the small size of cinema film rather than the the large format plate film that was still common uh, in the early part of the 20th century, which meant that you'd carry this camera around with you and take take images like like this one, which is one of Cartier-Bresson's uh, many famous uh, kind of slice of life images, thanks to the, the, uh, the unobtrusive nature of the, of the camera. And, and yet another material at work in, in photography is, is the, the optical element itself. This isn't something we tend to think about, of course, because you know, the, the lens is encased in, in plastic or metal, and you don't see the way that it's designed on the inside. But, but in fact, there are different ways of designing optics and you know, tolerances for lens grinding have changed over the century. And again, we could conceive of those changes as just the triumph of technological progress. And some photographers think of it that way. But, but in fact, there are, there are aesthetics at work in the design of, of optical systems. Um, you know, and so uh, you know, just as when you, when you shoot an image with, uh, with a smaller aperture, then you can increase de depth of field and, uh, and take a, an, an image more readily from, from the hip or quickly without looking at, at the framing of the image. Uh, you know, so you 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 get different effects when you uh, when you treat optical uh, optical techniques in, in a different way. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, about the photography of Brassai is that these uh, these dreamy, impressionistic, um, uh, out of focus, almost like like kind of kind of blurry images aren't the result of of uh, optical constraints, but of the of the exposure that, that he used to take the, the images at night. I mean, partly this was long duration photography required at night, but he used to shoot them during during misty or rainy evenings in particular because the, the rain would disperse areas of high contrast, kind of taking that environmental moisture in the air and using it as a, as a diffusion filter. Um, or in the case of, of lens design itself, these, these different uh, different tolerances um, uh, for for optical aberrations at uh, at different apertures were were trade offs that, that their early optical designers uh, had to think about and you know, these these are two designs for very well well known and and, and, and widely used designs for a, a, a fifty millimeter uh, thirty five millimeter camera lenses um, and the the one on the top which is called sonar which was invented in in nineteen twenty four uh, has Better contrast and and, and 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 less flare, but more aberrations than the than the slightly more complex planar design, which which was sharp but increased flare because, as you can see, there are increased opportunities for light to refract within the, the multiple elements inside of the design, uh, and and this this you could look at as sort of a technology problem, like how can we make these lenses better so that they have fewer aberrations and better contrast and less flare, and we want it all, or you could say, well, no, there are different aesthetics that are possible with these with these you know material conditions, so. The, the sonar admits certain kind of vignetting and distortions, but it tends to do so evenly across the lens surface, which creates a kind of smooth tones and shapes. Um, and, and this is a modern, a modern um, implementation of this of this old design that just came out a couple of years ago. Zeiss reintroduced this this lens design, um, and it retains those optical features. But but because these old, these are very old lenses, if you if you found one that was seventy years old, it would tend to tend to be foggy and and uh, and not render well just because of age. Um, and th this design also had the strange benefit of front focusing slightly at its widest aperture, um, which is to say that it, it was designed to focus accurately at about f 2.8. But uh, but you buy a lens like this to to open it up. It's it's got a very wide um, maximum aperture, and uh, unfortunately Zeiss eventually corrected this feature because these kind of photographic gadgeteers started complaining on web forums and things. But the the result of, of the combination of these of these two designs here, you can see the the difference in the way it renders at those two apertures. The same lens, um, essentially the same image at the two apertures in the same uh, on the same uh, same camera. Um, that they draw differently. There's 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 an aesthetic difference between the the images that's not uh, not reducible simply to the composition or the lighting, but is is in, intrinsic to the way that the lens is is capable of rendering uh, what it sees on the film or on the on the charged couple device. 
and you know, flare is, is another uh, thing that we try to correct in photography. You, you generally we want to remove the the image on the on the left side, and we want to replace it with the one on the right side because the one on the left is uglier than the one on the right. Right? That's the kind of assumption that that most lens designers have uh, have expressed. This is this is two uh, two versions of my my front porch lights with two different uh, two different lenses, and you can see how uh, you know one of them flares considerably and the other doesn't. And it, on the one hand, we could say, well, you know, the image on the right seems to be more technically accurate, but there's there's something kind of interesting and aesthetic about the one on the left, and we might choose to adopt a you know a particular uh, optical device for its aesthetic features, not not simply because it has a certain maximum aperture or focal length. And, and just to prove that this is, I'm not just making this up with bad images of my porch. This is, uh, this is a fantastic photograph by, by Robert Frank from uh, his book, The Americans, which is published in the mid-1950s. And, and you can see that this is exactly the technique that's, that he's using in, the, in this image, the, the use, the creative use of lens flare to kind of blow out the highlights on this jukebox, which gives it this sort of incredible glow and almost ghost-like uh, feature is kind of ethereal godliness around the, the the strange music box, and that's kind of where the rhetorical heft of the image comes from. Um, okay, so you know when we think about materials, the materials that work in computers, I think just like with photography um, or with books, it's it's tempting to think of them as being all the same. You know that we get more sophisticated and more powerful machines, but but other than that, they're all kind of doing the same thing. But just as uh, language and, and images resist uh, the kind of acid wash of, of semiotics that we've tried to impose on them, so computer systems aren't reducible to, to, to some single material form, whether that be electrical charges or binary data or, or even abstract Turing machines. And it's useful to think about, um, about how that works, about what one does when one creates things uh, with computers. Um, Nick Monfort and I have offered the perspective of platforms as one way, one productive way to think about the coherent sets of shared constraints that tend to be packaged in hardware or software form. And actually, we use that word platform when we talk about other things, too. We talk about like a, a platform that an automobile manufacturer builds a number of different models on. We might even talk about a platform for a, a set of uh, photographic devices. You know, Canon has a platform for their single lens reflex cameras. Uh, but but in the computer, the platform is also kind of like weirdly nested and 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 and, and recursive. Um, the creator of a computational work could do their creativity by designing circuits and soldering chips, um, or that author could write instructions for the integrated circuits and microprocessors of some particular computer, or, or uh, she might write software in some high-level programming language uh, like Java, which is portable through a virtual machine to many different platforms. Um, or, of course, uh, that author might create assets or 3D models to be added to some, uh, some 3D virtual world or something like that. And then, of course, we could just simply take uh, digital versions of uh, analog media and then embed those inside of other computational artifacts, like putting digital video um, in a website. And you know, all of these uh, are valid ways of being creative with computers, but they're functioning um, together in many cases. They're, they're kind of nested. And, and when, you, when you choose a platform to work on as a creator of computational media, then you're, you're making a choice not just of convenience, but also one of, uh, of delivery, one of, of simplification, but, but also one of aesthetics, even if we don't realize all the time that those are aesthetic decisions. The work that's built for a platform is sort of su supported and constrained by what that platform can and can't do. And, and these platforms, again, are weirdly layered in, in, in ways that, um, that sometimes are inextricable from one another, where one is dependent on another. So for example, the, the, if, you use, if you use Windows, um, then this is sort of the, the, the setup, the, the, the nested platform setup that your, uh, that your computer is, uh, is deployed on. Uh, at the hardware level, the, the Intel x86 instruction set architecture has, has made possible the creation of many different kinds of software, including things like operating systems, of which various versions of Windows are examples. And those operating systems, in turn, give us software development frameworks like uh, the Microsoft Foundation classes with which you can make uh, Windows programs more easily. And then that development platform allows software developers to create other programs, like let's say uh, Adobe Flash, which you can use as a platform for multimedia creation, and then you can take those artifacts that you publish with Flash and put them on the web. 
And, and all of these relate to one another in, in kind of evolutionary ways, um, but also in, in, in kind of dependency to one another. So it's useful to kind of backtrack um, and think about simpler platforms sometimes to see how all of this works, how it all comes together. Um, I tend to think about this one a lot. Um, this is the Atari uh, VCS, uh, which was first manufactured in 1977. It's the first popular interchangeable cartridge home video game system. And it came with all of these, 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 these accessories in a box that looks something like this. And you know, at the time, uh, before, before the Atari, you would play games um, like, like this. You'd do, this is computer space and Pong, and you play these in, in pubs usually. And there was one game, and, and you, might, you might have enjoyed it, but you, know, you had to go to the bar to play it. Um, and, and Atari realized early on that it made sense for them to kind of bring these into the home. The home was a place where a wider variety of people could play more often. Um, and eventually, uh, these entire systems got put on chips. Um, in fact, this is a knockoff of the, uh, of the Pong chip from the, 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 the post-Christmas 1975 season. Eventually, every, everybody had their knockoff Pong TV game, which sort of saturated the market. And, and after all, I mean, if you're going to buy a Pong for your home, then you kind of only need one. I mean, you could try to sell me Super Pong, but frankly, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's still just Pong. Uh, it's kind of like selling somebody a dartboard. You know, you, you buy a dartboard and it's fun. You can play with your friends and you don't need like another dartboard. And, and that's the end of your industry. So, uh, you know, given the success of, of, of certain arcade games, uh, Atari wanted to design a machine that would play those games and games like them, but on these interchangeable cartridges. And it was designed uh, in the period between 1975 and 1976. And, and, and the, the constraints of the era, the cost of hardware, the, the kind of weird idea of what video games were at the time, um, the fact that they wanted it to be affordable, it was $200, $199 retail at the time, um, it meant that they, they ended up designing this like, it's just super weird computer. Um, they wanted to do it as cheaply as possible, and, uh, and there was a new microprocessor uh, called the 6502 made by Moss Technologies, and actually Atari opted for an even cheaper version that had fewer pins, which meant it could address uh, even less memory uh, than the 64K that was possible with that, with that machine. They designed uh, a custom graphics chip called the Television Interface Adapter, used an off-the-shelf peripheral interface which connects to the joysticks and whatnot. Um, at the time, RAM was really expensive, and 128 bytes was a reasonable amount to buy for a machine of this of this nature. Think about that for a minute, right? Like, it's like a sentence of text. Um, and the, the the games were about two to four K in size, and that was partly limited by the address space of this uh, of this uh, smaller packaged microprocessor. Th there's a lot I could say about all of these, but the the heart of this machine was this this incredibly bizarre graphics and sound chip. Um, and it was designed to support very particular kinds of features in games, specifically these. Some kind of backdrop, two player sprites, two movable objects, one for each player, two missiles, one for each sprite, and, and a ball. Um, and that's it. These are the objects you get with the TIA. And you might ask, well, why? Like, why would you limit you know, what a game could be to these components? And the answer is, well, this is what video games are. These were the, the two most popular coin-op games of the, of the era uh, that Atari had made. A uh, Pong, in which you have, oh, let's see, two player sprites, a play-filled backdrop. You don't have any missiles, but you do have a ball. And a game called Tank, um, which had, let's see, oh yeah, two player sprites, a missile for each. There's no ball, and there's a play-filled backdrop. And, and you know, the idea was that this is kind of what games are. We'll make games sort of like this, and you know, th this machine won't last that long in the market anyway. Now, even weirder is the way that it, it draws to the, to the television screen. We tend to think of television and video images as being photographic, essentially, that they're kind of two-dimensional. And, and just as the, you know, the, the photograph is created all at once by the chemical operation of the film, and then you know, like in a moving image, it's, it's done many times per second, this is, this is what we see when we, when we take a kind of visual approach to, uh, to media. We see the two-dimensional surface of the screen in the same way that we see the two-dimensional surface of a painting. But there are actually many kinds of, of, of television-like displays. And something like an oscilloscope operates quite a bit differently th than a television. This is uh, arguably the first video game uh, created in 1958 um, called Tennis for Two, which is drawing its, its picture on, a, on an oscilloscope. And these, um, these vector or XY displays, which, uh, which kind of point, point a, a movable beam that, that can be arbitrarily moved uh, within the screen, um, 
were quite popular in uh, in, in the in the 60s and in the 70s and even into the 80s because they could produce higher resolution graphics. This is Space War, and if you've played Asteroids, it's uh, it's drawn with this technique. And you know, like this way of rendering a uh, I'll call it a television picture um, with a, a computer connected device feels like 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 drawing to us because we're inscribing the surface the 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 uh, the, the, the phosphor coated surface of the screen in the same way that like a, a pen moves on the paper but but games like pong or the magnavox odyssey were not implemented that way they were connected to televisions and uh they were built with uh, in this case diode transistor logic or ttl and, and the electronic signals um, that, that those uh, that those circuits developed were directly manipulating the TV display. There was no software interface. These are these are just like direct manipulations of the signal to the television, which meant that to get any kind of kind of visual appearance at, at all, you would have to do something like like strap a, a static cling display onto your TV screen when you played your Odyssey. So this so looks like it looks like hockey instead of like this. Now. Um, it was into this kind of era that the Atari, um, that the Atari uh, was built. And uh, the way that it draws its television picture is so unique. I know of no other computer that operates quite like it. And to understand it, it's useful to think about how a, tele a computer display like the one that I'm using now really works. Typically, we have some, some image which is, is, um, is stored in data and then is, is copied into some memory space. Um, and that memory space holds like a whole screen's worth of information all at once. And then in order to prevent flicker, you take that, that memory space and you copy it to the visible display and you do that many times uh, per second in order to get, uh, to get the image. But um, remember that the Atari um, it has 128 bytes of RAM and in order to have a memory space on which you could move an entire screen's worth of image, then you'd have to have enough memory to store that screen's worth of image. But there is no available memory like that on the Atari, so it doesn't have this buffer. Um, and instead, uh, what happens is that the, the machine interfaces directly with the electron gun in the CRT display. Um, and every scan line of that display picture, a, 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 a cathode ray tube television operates by, by scanning um, the electron gun across the, the surface of the screen horizontally and then turning off and returning to the, to, the, to the next line and doing that again and again all the way down the screen. So when you program the Atari, what you're really doing is interfacing with the display at every scan line uh, of the television picture, which is like a totally mind-bending way uh, to, draw, to draw an image. And, and if we look at it, this is combat, which is tank for the Atari. Um, if you look at, at the way that this game reveals its, its, material, its material structure, the material structure of the machine itself, then we're actually capable of kind of almost seeing through it, seeing the, the machine through it. We have these, these two sprites, and um, each of them has a missile. Uh, and by the way, each sprite can be a different color. Um, and, and, and the sprites themselves, uh, they're a byte wide, and all that, that conveniently makes an image like that. Um, and, and then even though it looks like they're square pixels, the, 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 the pixels on, on the, they're not really pixels, the, the stuff out of which uh, a VCS image is made are, are sort of rectangular in shape. They just look square in the case of this biplane because it's two lines worth of rectangles that make a square. Um, but they're really structured like this. And it's because a pixel doesn't, the concept of a pixel just doesn't exist on the Atari because you're, you're scanning the display horizontally and altering the oscillations of the, of the RF frequency by configuring this television interface adapter at the right moments then really what, the closest thing you have to a pixel is like the, the smallest amount of time that can pass before the TIA can change the signal it sends to the RF modulator to alter the color pattern rendered in any given moment on the television display, which is nothing that I have a word for. <laughs> uh, and, and many features of this game are just like kind of direct mappings to the hardware. For example, there are variations of like these plane combat games. You can have like one big plane and, and, and three small planes, and each player controls one. And, it just happens that um, you know there are some bits that you there's some bytes you can set on the TIA that changes the number and size of uh, of the sprite, and all of this is done in hardware for you. Um, in fact, the, this this is a this is a, sc a screenshot of the the manual that shows you all of the different features, the variations. So this you would have gotten it in the box, and um, this this uh, this table, this like lookup table of different settings kind of exists in the game, like in the ROM of the game, almost exactly the way that it's represented in the manual. Uh, it's very strange, right? Uh, I think one of the bits is flipped. You can see the binary on the, on the, on the right side. 
Um, and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of other things, that all, all strange aesthetic decisions that we might attribute incorrectly to, to uh, kind of higher order um, art historical tendencies. Like the, these play field graphics, the, 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 the hardware has two and a half bytes worth of, of, of storage in which to draw this pink stuff that you see, which is 20 bits. And that, that turns out is half the size of the screen. It's organized like this. And um, what the machine does is it just doubles just doubles those 20 bits to the other side, and you get this, this lovely horizontal symmetry in these games. And in fact, this is mirrored because you can flip a bit on one of the TIA's registers and mirror it instead of, instead of doubling it. Um, and I'll just give you one example of how easy it is to misconstrue some of these material constraints as aesthetic, higher level aesthetic decisions. So um, there's this essay in, in a book called Gamers by the uh, poet named Mark Lamoureux. And, and he's trying to kind of use Frank Boaz's, Franz Boaz's um, uh, arguments about our history to talk about uh, Atari games. Um, th this is Lamoureux. The style of representation in the games is unburdened by the constraints of realistic mimesis and reveals in its blocky forms and garish colors, revels in its blocky forms and garish colors. As programming technique was refined, individual companies began to develop signature styles. The manipulation of the horizontal axis corresponds with techniques employed in the early stages of conventional art as Boas describes, and this is now Boas, the prevalence of horizontal and the rarity of vertical symmetry is presumably due to the absence of vertically symmetrical movements, that is, physical movements, except in those rhythmic movements in which the arms are alternately raised and lowered, and in the rarity of natural forms that are vertically symmetrical. Um, or it's because there's 20 bits of storage, <laughs> and the machine is doubling or mirroring. Now, you could say, well, why is it designed that way? And maybe there's some you know, kind of psychoanalysis you could perform on the hardware designers. <laughs> now we can do this with, with, with Atari games um, and sort of see how they negotiated between the material constraints and affordances of different systems. Like Yar's Revenge started out as a, as a port of a very popular uh, XY display uh, coin op game called Star Castle. And it's a complicated game in which you're shooting at this cannon in the center of these rotating shields. But this is a game that works on a display like Space War or like uh, asteroids, it looks like this. And, and by the way, the color was a, a plastic kind of overlay. The, the, the XY dis the, these XY displays were all just, just black and white. Um, so this is what it looked like. And e even with the limited amount of information that you now possess about the Atari, you can imagine that this would be a difficult thing to render on that machine. And uh, the developer of, of uh, Yard's Revenge realized this too. This is Howard, Howard Scott Warshaw talking about this many years later. I realized a decent version, that is, of, 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 of Star Castle couldn't be done. So I took what I thought were the top logical and geometric components of Star Castle and reorganized them in a way that would better suit the machine. And what he came up with was, was Yar's Revenge. And it looks like this. Um, and let's see, I think I have, um, yeah, look, you could see it. Well, let's have some. Okay. I'll just give you a sense of how it looked. Yeah, that's Yar's Revenge. And one of the things that, that's amazing about this game is that uh, it's hard to it's hard to, to, to describe, but these these vector displays were incredibly luminescent and, and glowed in a, just a kind of magical way. And the the, the very colorful um, neutral zone area in this game was was Warshaw's attempt to recreate that kind of that kind of visual feeling, I think. And he did it with color because color was one of the virtues of the Atari. It had a very low resolution graphics, but 128 colors. Um, and in fact, this particular, I won't linger on this too much, although I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you look at more assembly code soon. The, this particular um, this stripe, this, this oscillating colored stripe, is produced in such an amazing way. It's, it's, uh, it's actually the source code of the game itself, which he's loading as data uh, and masking um, and then reusing for the pattern in, the, in one of the playfield sections and also the color. Uh, and this is a very efficient algorithm through which to render uh, that, that tremendously complex image that kind of harkens back to the Commodore 64 image. So you, it's almost, you can almost think of these relationships between the material of these games and the, the artifacts themselves as, as, as being akin to, um, to like a scrim in, in theater craft. There's this, you know, this piece of gauze that, that appears opaque until it's, it's kind of lit from behind, you know, and then it becomes translucent. You can kind of see through it. You, you can see through the, the artifact to the, to the hardware behind you. You can kind of see them at the same time. And, and what the Atari is really like as a, as a system to develop for is it, this feeling of making stuff for it because of this line by line technique is much more like um, writing or like plowing or something um, than it is like rendering a, a two dimensional image like a photograph. Um, 
Okay, um, I, I guess we sort of have time for this. Let's, let's, I thought it might be useful to show you what this feels like, which is a totally crazy thing to do, but okay. Um, so I've set up Xcode to allow me to run um, Atari games. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Yeah, okay, um, this, is a, a, this is the code required to make the screen black uh, on the Atari. And this is, this is the Atari emulator called Stella. Um, and you don't need to worry about, about all this, but, um, but I'll, I'll just show you a few of the features uh, of the machine and kind of how weird, uh, how weird it is to program. So um, don't worry too much about what I'm doing. I'm just kind of putting some, some values in, um, in RAM and then um, I'm, I've got this little loop here that's drawing 192 scan lines worth of, worth of television picture, which is how many I need to get a whole television's worth of image on the Atari. Um, and I'll just, I'll just load um, that, that value from RAM, and I'm going to store it in the place on the, uh, on the, on the TIA, which, which sets the background color of the, of the image. Uh, and then I'll increment that color every line. Um, and the, the, when I say that color, all I mean, mean is an 8-bit number. Um, and like that's, that's, that's the same, that's all I need to do to get this incredibly strange um, visual image. And it's because the way that the, that the colors increase in the, in the lookup table that it uses on the TIA is by this kind of color luminescence order. Um, and, and I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that later on. Um, I, I, don't have, I don't have a lot of time. and I don't want to spend much of all, all of it, the, the remainder that I have live coding and assembly. But I do want to show you <laughs> one, um, one thing. Let's see what I can do here. Um, Forgive me while I silently code here. Um, I'm just going to slow this down because otherwise you're going to have seizures. Uh, so we'll do this. Um, having uh, autocomplete on uh, 6502 assembly is fantastically convenient. Okay. Uh, mouse screen. Okay. And then um, what I'm going to do here is. So I'm, I'm just going to do that, that Howard Scott Warshaw technique, basically, where I'm, I'm going to take the code itself, which starts at that particular address, and I'm going to offset it by the value in, in one of the, the processor registers, and I'm going to store that as the background color. Um, and then I'm going to hope that this runs in the way that I expect. Yeah. So. Um, this seemingly random pattern is actually just kind of the effect of uh, of the code that I have, and the reason that it stops is because that's all the data that was in the that was in the ROM at the time. So it's like how many, how large, how large is it? Let's see. Um, yeah, that's um, eighty three bytes worth of worth of stuff. Okay, we can come back to that later if you feel like looking at more Atari code. Yes. Right. Okay. So um, we can kind of adopt this, this platform-oriented approach um, to activating or accentuating the, the different layers of kind of material affordance that are present in different media. And, and there's this, this term multi-coding that, that Nick Monford and Michael Matias have used to, to, to think about this process. They actually use it in reference to weird programming languages. Uh, uh, like, like there's this international obfuscated C code contest in which um, People write strange C programs, and, and this is an example of a C program that kind of reads like love letters. Uh, this compiles and, and it runs as a like a she loves me, she loves me not simulator. Um, the, this is a programming language called Pete. The, well, the image on the left is a composition with red, yellow, and blue by Pete Mondrian, and the image on the right is a Pete programming language program that outputs the text Pete, and it works by by walking this image and changing its operations based on the colors in the image. These are some other PEAT programs. Um, or uh, I use this in my class. This is a programming language called Chef in which the programs are recipes. And, and the challenge with this stuff is like to, to, try to try to be creative in every register. So this is, a, this is a program one of my students wrote called Irish Cream Dessert Squares. Um, and you can, follow, you can follow the recipe and create those dessert squares, which are shown here. They, they bring in their homework that day. And we eat it. And if you run this program, it calculates squares of numbers, it calculates the square of, of, a, of, a, of a given input. Um, so you know you've got this 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 uh, this, this program that, that that has like the aesthetic register of the of the program itself. Is it legible? Can you follow it in the kitchen when it runs in the computer? Does it do something interesting? And then is it is it like gastronomically satisfying? So you know multi coding kind of exists beyond um, 
just esoteric programming languages. And I think, in fact, we could adopt this as a strategy for, um, for making works that, that function um, on all these registers at once, creatively and critically and even historiographically. And so I, I want to close by, by sharing my latest project with you, which is this strange game for the Atari called A Slow Year. Um, and I, I don't know, programming the Atari is a very strange experience. Um, and I, I've been working on you know, different titles for it. I made this game a couple years ago called Guru Meditation, which uses an old uh, Amiga inner, uh, uh, peripheral called the Joy Board, which is like a joystick you stand on. And you know, there's this strange um, lo like folklore in, in Amiga OS development that, that the Guru, the, the, they, they, they would sit on the Joy Board. They made the Joy Board while they were working on the operating system to bring some revenue into the company. And then the programmers of the Amiga operating system during the long rebuild times of the OS would try to sit as still as possible on the joy board because they were so stressed out uh, from the development of the Amiga operating system. And supposedly this is where the guru meditation error message on the Amiga OS comes from. Um, and so I kind of remade that game for the Atari and you know, did it in this limited edition. And I ported it to the iPhone you know, so that you could like, just sit there and play it. And, um, <laughs> and you know, there's this historical connection to the Atari, but, but what I realized later was that there was something else also going on, that the kind of, the Atari is this strangely slow machine that even though you have to rush to set up scan lines to kind of race the beam, as the title of our book suggests, that it's a very slow kind of ginous programming experience. Every cycle counts and, and nothing is wasted. And you don't have to worry about like, you know, the next newfangled gimmick that's gonna come out. This is a 33-year-old machine. Um, and, and, and so like sitting there programming the, the computer in 6502 was something I wanted to kind of carry that experience out in the game itself, the kind of purity of being right up against the metal where it's quiet and it's just you and the, and the microprocessor and this chip. And, and in fact, it was really just you in the, in the heyday of the Atari. Um, commercial Atari games were made by, by single people uh, who would talk about their games in the manual. And, 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 you know, and so um, those, those themes were then you know, kind of invitations for me to think about what I wanted to do creatively. And, and I, wanted, I was interested in, in, in poetry and the kind of relationship between the constraints of poetry that I was talking about earlier and what was possible to, uh, uh, to render on the machine. You know, imagism was an interesting influence, but also haiku, because you know, haiku has a, 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 well, not only a strong effect on imagism, but also a, uh, a, very, a very simple condensed structure. Um, and, and, I, and I kind of ran with that and, and did this, this combination of constraint and abstraction in, in, in poetry and um, em, embraced those in, in four games, which have similar themes that, that haiku might, each of the four seasons, um, each of which was one, kilo, one kilobyte in size to fit on the 4K cartridge. Um, and I, I decided I would call them poems. I would call them game poems. Um, and um, you know they 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 they're very strange and they they, they play really slow and you know the, you, you you wait for the leaves to fall and try to figure out where they land and um and, and you, you you enjoy a uh, I can't see this image on my screen but in, in the in the in the winter game you enjoy a cup of coffee as the sun rises and the the spring game is about watching a thunderstorm and then the summer game is about napping. Um, <laughs> And like you know, all of these these influences, naturalism and imagism and haiku, are kind of kind of in the, the Atari itself. Like the the kind of un unacknowledged tradition of naturalism in, in games like like Pitfall or, or, or Barnstorming, which use that that color banding that's intrinsic to the way that the colors are set up on the machine to produce these kind of these kind of simple elements, these simple landscape like elements. And and I, I wanted to to just kind of make the whole screen feel like that. Um, and doing stuff like this in the Atari is, is kind of hard. Like the, uh, remember, there are only those, those six movable objects. So the, the wind and the rain are produced essentially through optical illusion by, by rapidly moving and changing the, the movable objects in the screen. And, and you know, then putting them in first person, you know, that, that you're kind of sort of, kind of, sort of looking. And you, the way that you nap is you, you push the button to close your eyes. Uh, and this is what it looks like and, and so forth. That, the, that, that, kind of, that kind of slowness um, of not acting, but of thinking and doing and watching could still be made into into a game, a real game, not just an environmental simulation. Like like there, there's been certain aesthetics in games recently that are more about creating environments than about creating creating games. And I wanted I wanted the games uh, in a slow year to um, to be playable, to, to have challenge in them, to, to be true to the the origins of the, of the game system. And then when you when you think about um, when you think about like marketing a game like this, um, there are some interesting challenges. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, like the conventions of the Atari are different, and you would have you would have had a manual, and 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 there's been this kind of retro aesthetic recently that some people are, are, are a bit tired of. But you know, I didn't want the retro aesthetic to be to be a kind of uh, uh, of nostalgia. Rather, I was I was choosing some very deliberate aesthetics, um, and I also didn't want to explain how to play the game in this kind of deliberate call out way, like here's the leaf, you know. Um, so I returned to this idea of poetry and, and the idea that I could maybe embed the game in a book and get back to that idea that I mentioned earlier, which is that the book is, is an artifact that we don't think about enough. And you know, what would I put in a book? Well, I could put poetry in a book. And in fact, the, the instructions are, um, are, are haiku. Uh, you get to play the game. And, and then I wrote a haiku generator that, um, that just, generates, um, just generates poetry that, that, that are themed to the, to the seasons uh, in the game. And uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so I made, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Come on, what would it mean? This is the problem of using transitions. Oh, there we go. Um, so I made 1,024 of them, 1K, to um, you know, correspond with the size of the, of the, of the games and, and just filled this book with them, which, which kind of act as sort of idea, idea systems. And, you know, and then like the whole packaging of the game is important too. It's not just what's on the screen, but the relationship between the visual image and the way that it was kind of marketed in the heyday of the Atari. You know, uh, yeah. You know, you have to you know, you have to give someone a sort of hook into into understanding what the like what's the what's the game and what's the fiction. How do you how do you reconcile those two? So if this is if this is my game, then like. Um, <laughs> You know, this is what it looks like, and, and so it's packaged. Um, like it's made cartridges, and, and and then of course the the, the PC and Mac versions. You know, you have to you have to set the expectation with players that they're playing a Atari game, um, and all of these things I hope can kind of come together to demonstrate what I mean by by doing this kind of multi coding, uh, where you take material seriously. Um, now, I, I got some flack from my colleagues in, in the game development community for spending my time refactoring assembly instructions to fit on a four kilobyte cartridge for a 33-year-old game system instead of working on more immediately relevant problems. And, and you know, my, my answer to that is that, that, that this, this machine is, is alive. It's, it's no different than writing sonnets or, or, or doing glass blowing or, or, or shooting photographs with view cameras. And that, that all of these materials out there, they have um, something to teach us that they're um, they're just not always speaking in our native languages, and we have to learn to listen to them and figure out how to make their, their materials speak as much as their messages do. Thanks very much. I wonder if you, if we could say that there's something really conservative about linguistic term uh, mm -hmm. return in that, uh, in that, you know, there's there's this attempt to turn aesthetic decisions into moral or ethical or political decisions. Right. Like when you were showing your the picture of your the two uh, your 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 porch light. Yeah. Right. The one on the left is just as real as the one on the right. But right. we want to say that the one on the right that's really real. Right. That's right. what it looks like to us. Right. Without the intervention of the apparatus, right, right, right. The whole and so, of documentation. It, yeah. and, and is there? Do we ignore? Not uh, we, of course, because we're all very smart. That's right. Do people <laughs> ignore that apparatus because it allows them to ignore the fact that they are making aesthetic decisions and they're not, you know, you know, really getting to reality or to the truth of things? Mm. Mm. I mean, I, I think we've just. I think what's happened is that we've whitewashed all material in in a very few. Materials, typically language. I mean, that's not fair. Semiotic signs, maybe. Um, these have become our obsession, um, and so I, I don't even know that we're aware enough uh, of what we're doing to say that we're ignoring them. It's rather that it would never occur to us that things could be made of anything other than signs or something like that. Um, and we don't have to throw that away. Um, I mean, my position would be that the. Every, everything exists equally. Um, that that we can talk about language and signs in the same breath as we want to talk about um, the uh, uh, the micro the, the design of the microprocessor and my computer that produces those signs, um, and they they relate to one another in complicated ways, and we don't get to call one primary. Um, but I, I, I my suspicion is that it's it's one of habit and ideology more than it's one of 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 strategy. 
right? That we're not doing these things tactically, but there there's something we don't think about thinking about. I thank you so much. Thanks. And I was born in Japan, and I grown up this kind of culture. So I'm, you know, it's very interesting this kind of topic right now. And my friends who's making game in Japan, these is they're kind of trying to develop more music side of perception of the game. Mm -hmm. You are talking about more visual perception, right, right, right? But you know, music is another important as aspect for the game yeah. player. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any kind of thoughts about this music? Right. This is this is this is basically just a flaw in my in my uh, in my knowledge. I'm, I'm I tend to think about these these visual um, visual problems more than than sonic ones. And if you've read um, Racing the Beam, Nick and my book on the Atari, you'll notice that we don't talk enough. About, about sound. I could have done that very same thing that I did using the data that made the code of the, that comprised the code of the uh, program, it's hardly a game, um, to render interesting sound as well. Um, so yeah, this is the, the these sorts of, uh, of material conditions also underlie the, the sonic uh, aspects of, uh, of media, not just computer media, but media in general. Um, I just have a, a tendency to think about, about visual things instead. A little string of things. Uh, how does the assembler you use differ from the ones that people right. used to use? Right, right, right. Do you have an emulator on which you can run that assembler, or right. is life too short? Yeah, no. This is this is. <laughs> so I can, you know, the way that uh, the way that uh, David Crane or, or 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 Carol Shaw would have would have written Atari games um, was not like this, you know. I mean, this is so. Like, I, I just build and run. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> and you know, and then I'm back in my code, and I can debug really quickly. Uh, and this is not how they. In fact, there were different eras of um, of Atari development, and in, in, in some of them, they used VIC-20s connected to these these sort of apparatuses that let them do something close to build and run on television. But that wasn't until the early '80s. Beforehand, they were doing most of this blind, and then they would have to do EEPROM burns, and it was very um, time consuming. So you'd have to really think about the way that you coded. And one of the things that emerged out of it were these sort of strange workrooms. Um, in the early days of Activision, they all sat in the same room, kind of facing the wall, and would, would occasionally interrupt one another. And there's this, I guess, I don't know, if it seems somewhat apocryphal, the story of, of Carol Shaw, who made River Raid, you know, saying, you know, I need some code to get that, that kind of klaxon-y warning sound that you get with the when you're running out of fuel. Like, what should I use for that sound? And, and uh, David Crane told this story, so it's a very David Crane-centric story. David, David Crane is the, the guy who made Pitfall. Uh, and he said, well, you know, I leaned back in my chair and I, uh, I recited a few lines of, uh, of Assembler, and, uh, and that was, that was the, the code that went into uh, to River Raid. Um, I mean, it might be true. Uh, it's a great story anyway. But, but the, yeah, the, the conditions under which we create are, are something we can't ignore either. Um, but they change, and I'm not that, for me personally, when I make Atari games, I'm more interested, I'm interested in certain things. There, there are other ways that we could go about this in which we'd be interested in the, the experience of, of the work experience. And in the early days of Atari, the work experience was, okay, you're hired, um, go into that room and come back in six months with a game. And in, in days of, and Activision was very different. And in magic was very different, and, and you know, so all of those things are are possible as like work aesthetics that you could you could embrace. Yeah, it's a good point. During your talk, you had mentioned a lot about constraints, and something I've actually been noticing in for video game systems is that they're actually working on removing graphics constraints, processing power restraints, and I'm just wondering. What do you think that's actually doing to the nature of video games? Okay, so um, it's tempting to think that what's happening is that we're getting more and more and more, but really we're just getting different constraints. The, the constraints are always there. With the Atari, it's very, very, very easy for me to show you, I think convincingly, that the constraints were dire. Yeah. You know, here's 108 bytes of RAM, and you've got a, like, this graphics thing that doesn't really work right, and um, these, these six movable objects, what do you do? But in fact, um, the the architecture of the um, the IBM cell processor in the PlayStation 3 is designed in a particular way that makes programming it incredibly arduous, um, and it's really designed for throughput and is therefore very good at doing things like very fast math calculations and similar data to render uh, uh, 3D um, 
3D data to the screen, um, but is not so great for kind of messy code, um, which is the kind of thing we use for gameplay, actually, um, you know, artificial intelligence or, or whatever. Uh, that's one simple example in a contemporary system. So the constraints are not gone by any means. They may be um, nested and harder to see, and, and they may be, um, in, in kind of material terms, um, less dire. That is to say, we have a lot more memory now and a lot more storage space now. But the structure of these machines is still imposing um, just as many constraints. They're just different, different in nature. So we can, we can kind of like level the playing field, even if, even if there are technological advances, and, and ask, well, what are the different, what are the different aesthetics that kind of naturally or artificially emerge from, uh, from different platforms when we push them to their limits, or when we, when we try to do exactly what they want us to do. Uh, and those are questions that I wish, um, I wish creators asked more, actually, rather than how can we get um, the same game that we've been making uh, through this new machine. I, I don't know if the world is ready to think about the machine itself. Like, we just hide it in the cabinet. We don't want to look at it or worry about it or think about it. It, unless it kind of breaks in a sort of Heideggerian broken tool sort of way, like my PlayStation 3 is overheating because it's in my cabinet and it runs really hot. But not, oh, my, you know, my PlayStation 3 has the following hardware components, and this game showed me something new about their configuration. That's almost unthinkable, right, in contemporary aesthetics. <laughs> All right, I have two questions. Um, first, I ask, as the grandson of Ralph Baer, um, what are your opinions on or your thoughts on when there were when the restrictions were not even in RAM and stuff like that? It was in how you could actually wired the system, yeah. right? And there was there was no cartridge you could put in to change how the system thinks. It was just you had to wire everything just right for it to work, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a different material. Working working in circuit design is different from working in software. And the the other thing that was that was fascinating about um, you know many early. Coin up games as well as uh, these early console games, the, the 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 brown box that became the the Odyssey, as well as the uh, the early Pong systems, um, were, were just uh, designed in circuit logic, and the cost of individual circuits was 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 a big concern, right? There's um, I guess the most famous story is the the old uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak story. You guys know this? The the, the okay the so. Uh, this is this is a, an, an Atari story, but, but you'll forgive me because I'm an Atari guy. Um, uh, Nolan Bushnell hired uh, Steve Jobs to design um, to design the circuitry, to design the, the hardware essentially for Breakout for the game Breakout, which they had done the game design for in house. And and Steve Jobs didn't have the faintest idea how to design the circuitry for, for Breakout, but he had this friend Steve Wozniak who knew a lot about designing computers. And gave the problem to him and offered him some menial, you know, like th there was a bonus that was offered based on the, the, the number of circuits under a certain number that he could produce it in because it cost more to make more of them. And, uh, and so he gave it to Waz, and Waz had access to these like really weird chips um, from working at HP, uh, which were not uh, publicly available. Um, and he came up with this ridiculously simple design that, that, that Jobs took back to Atari. Um, and technically met the requirements, but couldn't be produced in scale because the, the, the system wasn't available. So I think Al Alcorn just redesigned the whole thing uh, in-house eventually. And um, as I understand it, Steve Jobs kept the, uh, the bonus and, uh, and, 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 and Wozniak never knew about it until many years later. Uh, but but the, you know, the, the, design of, uh, the design of circuits is, is, no, is different in kind, but not in nature from the, uh, the design of microprocessor instructions. One of the things that um, is worth pointing out in, in, in light of this question is that the, the um, my computer's still on here, the, um, uh, this may not be worth doing. Okay. It, it kind of looks as though the Odyssey has cartridges, but it doesn't. All, 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 all it has are, are dip switches that are being changed by the kind of fixed, um, uh, fixed metal brackets inside of the, the, the cartridges that you would put inside of this machine. And it's all on the board. All of the logic is on the board of this, of this device. None of it is in the, the, the game, the thing that you would think of as the game. The game is just configuring the circuit to behave in a certain way relative to the television. But, but yeah, you know, the, 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 it's just a different way of working, right? A different material to work in than, a, you could call it a lower level material, but I would just call it a different, a different material to work in than microprocessor instructions is, is circuit design. What right. was the second question? The second question I asked as a programmer, which is, as to the restrictions on current games, which are getting less and less hardware-based, 
I mean, I wouldn't say less and less hardware based, but the, the hardware is becoming sim more and more similar. Or it's uh, it's being abstracted more. It's being abstracted more, exactly. Yeah. Like programming with DirectX, how you can make any Windows game yeah. off of any hardware because DirectX just handles all that for you. Right. Um, would you say that's making games more similar nowadays, even besides the fact that they're only produce the same game? Yeah, so the platforms that seem important to us may not be like the the system, the box, the, 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 the hardware component that we think of when we think of the game console, but rather some sub-component where the platform really lives, like a, a particular graphics card, or a, a software rendering system like DirectX, or um, oh, what's another example, a game engine, some game engines, that Unreal, um, a, a, a physics uh, middleware system, that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess the way that you could, you could put it is that we're, we're tending to, um, okay, the, the level of granularity with which we think creatively about game design is coarser, it's far coarser, because we, we tend to think in terms of these building blocks rather than in terms of kind of whole cloth, you know, I've got this machine, what can I do with it? There are lots of reasons for it, you know, many of them are, are financial um, or risk related, and, and there's lot, lots of excuses we can make. But clearly what's happening is that we're, we're just thinking more coarsely about creativity. And you could imagine, I would like to think, that uh, thinking more granularly about creativity would lead to different and perhaps more interesting experiences. Uh, but doing so is something that, that at least in, in, in the game industry, resists um, primarily for fiscal reasons rather than for creative ones. Well, what you've described here today is, in essence, um, a uh, playground or sandbox of erector set elements or tinker toys or whatever, this being one example right. of certain elements that have constraints. Mm -hmm. And as technology evolves, we have a wider and wider set of things to play with, if you will. Mm -hmm. So from an artistic standpoint or programmer standpoint, uh, some of the challenge is to be able to put some of these things together creatively mm -hmm. and uh, generate something of interest. Yeah. So the bottom line uh, uh, from my standpoint that I would ask is from your standpoint, um, what is it uh, that really makes game design of any sort uh, what are the psychological elements that are required to create compellingness and absorption by the individuals who then want to play the games? Yeah. Because there are certain aspects of that that make certain games either interesting or not interesting. And that, to me, would be of interest. If yeah. You know. I mean, you, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm often accused of making games that are not interesting. So uh, it, it's possible that I'm, I'm the wrong person to, have to pose this question to. Uh, I, I think that the, the experience of game, well, the reason game design is appealing to me in light of many of the other things that are appealing to me, many of which I touched on today, is because it is um, uh, structurally identical to those other kinds of negotiations. Like what you do when you design a game is uh, to create this, this possibility space in which people can explore the implications of the rules that you've put together. Just as when I program the Atari, I am kind of subjecting myself to the, the, the somewhat arbitrary but, but, but explainable constraints that that system maintains. Or, or, or when, I, um, when I pick up a, t a particular photographic apparatus with, with a particular optical apparatus and I ask, what, well, like, what can I do with it aesthetically? I am subjecting myself to that particular the configuration of optical hardware. Um, so they're kind of like all, they all feel the same. And, um, and with games, unlike, unlike with, um, I guess this is a controversial position, um, what I was gonna say is unlike with, with literature or film, which are, um, are not configurative systemic um, media generally, that is to say, even though you can interpret them in, in, in theoretically infinite ways, the, um, the works themselves are fixed rather than, um, than having kind of structural exploration that's possible within them. The words that are on the pages of the book are the same words all the time for everyone who reads it, uh, whereas the experience that you have with the game is, is that that you construct by negotiating um, choices in the context of, of its rules. So um, you could say that like, the, the thing that's, that's interesting about games uh, and that's, that's compelling about them is that, that exploration of, of a possibility space. Um, what is possible, and what does it mean that the things that are possible are possible? 
uh, and what do I do with that, that sense of the work that's been presented to me, um, rather than, um, you know, wh what is the, uh, what is the, the kind of, uh, what is the meaning of the story that I'm being told, or, or what are the implications of the image that I'm viewing. Um, you would think that, that like, the, this, this sort of, like, ludic experience, or some kind of, kind of experience of complexity or systematicity in games, we like to think, those of us who talk about games and learning and stuff, we like to think that that experience itself might lead us to um, um, a, a more deliberate, uh, the more deliberate pursuit of, of sort of uh, complex thinking in general. So, you know, for example, if you want to talk about uh, the global economy or, um, uh, you know, uh, climate change or something like that, it would be nice to think about it in terms of, well, there are kind of all these moving parts and they come together in complex ways and you know, I make this decision and it has this outcome and there's not really a great solution, but I, I'm beginning to understand how the system works. Uh, but in, in general, what we really want is an answer I instead. Now, I don't know if that's really happening. I, I think that, that instead what we're seeing is that the, the, uh, the kind of experiences that we have um, with games are, are, are striving to be more and more like um, the experiences we have with, with, with films and literature, partly because the game industry has such incredible Hollywood envy. Um, <laughs> but it's possible, right? So they, they all kind of feel, they feel like the same experience to me, that of, 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 of creating a possibility space um, and then in w which the player revels in exploring and, and, and considering uh, rather than creating a, a, an artifact or a piece of media um, that is that is delivered um, in, in the in the same way. Just as a brief follow-up uh, question, would, from your standpoint, uh, what do you find uh, most interesting about uh, the gaming experience? Is it the learning part, the challenge to better what you've done previously, or um, the entertainment value of it? Uh, obviously, simulation games give you you know informational content. Uh, how would you characterize the kinds of things that you particularly uh, really enjoy the most when you engage in this particular? Yeah, I, I mean, for me personally, it's 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 the uh, it's the ambiguity. You get this this the, the games that give you deeply systemic experiences um, are not are not striving to to pose questions or present answers, but rather to to give this sort of this sort of. Uh, well, the way I talk about it in, in, in the, the Slow Year book is that it's, it's, like, it's like discovering a, a lost civilization and kind of trying to piece together what, what the artifacts that remain might have meant. Um, that sort of sense of, of, of unknowing and having to, to reconstruct, um, impossibly reconstruct uh, some story, some, some explanation of how this system works together and why. That, that's, what's appealing, that's what's appealing to me. I'm a text adventure guy, and so mm -hmm. your uh, examples of Chef and Pete were making me think of Inform 7, which is a yeah. mm -hmm. language that attempts yeah. to, to use natural language to program text adventures so that the yeah. the programming environment becomes a metaphor for the game itself, each one, right. or the platonic ideal of each one at least, yeah. wants to understand you in natural language. I was wondering what you think about uh, attempts like that to unify the, the experience of creating the game with the experience of playing the game. So Inform 7 is really interesting um, for precisely those reasons of multi-coding that I was referring to earlier. And it's kind of hard to explain if you haven't seen it. It's so you know the, the text adventures and interactive fiction uh, in in Inform 6, the previous version of this system. What you would do is you would create these objects, which are usually spaces with things in them, and define certain behaviors, ways of moving through them. And with Inform 7, instead of instead of this object-based um, uh, like a somewhat traditional programming experience, you, you, you make these declarative, nat somewhat natural language-like um, sentences that, that describe the world that the computer then creates for you. You know, like there is a room and, and then in the room is a table. And, and actually, interestingly, what, what Inform 7 does is it takes that, langu that natural language and compiles it down to Inform 6, which then it uses to render in these, these common language formats that are used for, for um, interactive fiction readers. Uh, so uh, it's really fascinating from the, at that like multi-coding level. The thing that bothers me about a lot of conversations about Inform 7 is the transparency argument that this makes it easier to write interactive fiction because you don't have to worry about that code stuff. 
And actually, I think it makes it harder. My, my students have found it harder. When I have them do IF in Inform 7, it's been, I guess it's harder for them coming from you know imperative or, or object-oriented programming paradigms where they now have to think in these other terms. And for that reason, I love throwing it at them. So they have to see it a different way. Um, but when I, when, when I have tried my hand at Inform 7, I've been just very interested in that, that multi-layered experience, which unfortunately you don't get when you play the IF. You, you only get the, the rendered, compiled experience. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating example of, of one of many na so-called natural language programming environments that try to make the, the, the code read like, um, try to make it read naturally. The difference, of course, is that it doesn't really read naturally. It's just a, it's, an, it's yet another construction um, to think about and the aesthetic experience of writing um, in Form 7 code, right, is also, is that, that, that would be one register on which you could, you could think about um, the aesthetics of IF now, which I don't know if, I don't, I'm not up on the, on, the, on the current text adventure IF community as much as I'd like to be, but I don't know if anyone thinks of it that way. I wrote this story that happens to compile into a, a piece of interactive fiction, uh, but you don't need to worry about that. It's just the story. Or you could go compile if you want to. Or you know, here, here's, here are both side by side. I mean, maybe that's a silly idea, but um, I, I think there's been some experience in, in that regard. Anyhow, interesting, interesting to me as multi-coding as well as as a as a as a, as a kind of paradigm um, uh, as a programming paradigm, but not so interesting as a so-called natural way of of making it easier to write um, interactive fiction for non-programmers or something like that. Well, we've moved the gamut from materiality to multi-coding to aesthetics to all sorts of things. So please join me in thanking uh, Ian Bogos again for his time. Thank you.